Celebrating 45 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, more effort to level the playing field between meat packers and producers with a proposed law. In Southern Gardening, Gary's got a plant that may not have grown at the gates of Hades, but definitely stands up to the heat. In this week's feature, the pitfalls of urban farming. And we say goodbye to one of the nation's leading farm crisis experts. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Mike Russell. Good to have you with us once again here on Farm Week. We begin again with a story we've covered in some detail over the last two years. Congress and producers seeking to level the playing field with heavily consolidated meat packers. Price discovery is a big part of that strategy and now a bipartisan effort seems to be gaining traction. Josh Pittner has the story. This week, a bipartisan group of four U.S. senators announced a compromise on steps to improve cattle markets by combining parts of previous bills into a new forthcoming Cattle Price Discovery and Transparency Act. The move comes on the heels of pandemic-driven meatpacking supply chain labor issues, which reverberated down to livestock producers. How do you justify making such low bids when you're turning such a significant profit? Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa, a proponent of the bill, has accused the nation's four largest meatpacking corporations of operating in the shadows. Grassley has instigated several recent hearings to highlight the plight of declining cash markets for independent cattle producers who have wanted to leverage volatility into robust price discovery while meatpacker-driven contractual agreements grow, the likes of which dominate other sectors like hog and poultry production. But the bulk of such formula pricing is based on previously negotiated cash prices. The new proposed legislation takes a regional approach by establishing mandatory minimum thresholds of negotiated cash and grid trades based on each region's 18-month average trade and requires USDA to create and maintain a public catalog of marketing contracts between producers and processors while maintaining confidentiality. The American Farm Bureau and the National Farmers Union are among a number of state and national organizations which have thrown their support behind the measure. Beyond price transparency, Congress and producers are encouraging greater competition for the big four meat packers who right now control, for example, more than 85 percent of the beef market. New independent operations are coming online next year. The ag world lost a respected voice of reason not long ago, Dr. Neil Harrell, who helped lead the charge to save family operations during the farm crisis of the 80s, died recently in Ames, Iowa. Today we bring you a portion of a 2013 documentary in which he spoke sage words of advice. So what do current conditions mean for today's farmers? Some experts say farmers are much less leveraged, and as fate would have it, agriculture helped lead the nation back from the economic abyss during the latest recovery, as farm exports, commodity prices, and net farm income all soared to record highs. Rural land values also have climbed to unprecedented levels in recent years, fueling talk of bubbles and prompting some to wonder if history will repeat itself. We don't know whether it may occur in 2020, 2030, 2040, or earlier, but it's likely to happen again when people forget the lessons learned in the 1980s. Now, uh, right now, agriculture is doing very well, but I do urge everyone in the agriculture sector to think twice and to run in their business plans uh, a, a, a worst case scenario, not just a best case scenario. It isn't just somebody losing their job or losing a business. This, this was a whole, it was whole families that were involved and it was, you know, generations of families that were involved. And I think that that's important not to lose sight of. You can't borrow your way to prosperity. The markets are going to change and you have to be diversified. You have to be able to have um, 
you have to have cash, but you need to keep debt low and not high and not over leveraged. And I think that's been uh, the big lesson of the 1980s. What we need to have on an ongoing basis uh, is an ability to compete in the world. If you give the American farmer the chance to compete in the world, he'll take out everybody. Dr. Harl wore a lot of hats serving Iowa State University in many ag econ roles over the years. He was 88 years old. Recently, United States Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack toured central Iowa with his counterpart for Mexico, Secretary Arambula. Afterward, he sat down with Paul Yeager of our news partner, Market to Market, to reflect on the USMCA and our relationship with Mexico. Why is it important to have a good relationship with Mexico? Well, it's important to have a good relationship first and foremost with uh, my counterpart in Mexico because you have to have the ability to pick up the phone uh, or visit face to face and have frank and uh, trusted conversation. Uh, so that relationship becomes important to build. Um, I've, I actually have a relationship with Secretary Bilobos for some time, uh, so it's been a little bit easier uh, with him. Uh, it's important for the U.S.-Mexico relationship because so much of what we trade, so much of what we, what we sell overseas, if you will, uh, in our export, uh, one of our number uh, top three markets is Mexico for many of our products. In some cases, it's our number one market. So it's important, obviously, to make sure that we continue to have a good relationship. We continue to identify the problem areas in the relationship and try to work through them. USMCA was, I mean, you were familiar with NAFTA from your previous time. USMCA comes along. That was a big goal of the administ previous administration. How have you sorted through some of those changes and conversations you've had with Mexico? And you can throw in your Canadian counterparts, too. Well, I think the conversation with Mexico has been a little bit easier uh, as it relates to the USMCA because the problems we have there, uh, I think we can work through. For example, uh, while it is accurate that uh, Mexico has taken a pretty hard line in terms of genetically engineered crops that are grown in Mexico, it has not prevented that country from continuing to import into the country corn that's grown here in the U.S. using uh, GMO, GE technology. Um, our friends in Canada, it's a little different situation. Uh, one of the principal reasons why Congress voted in favor of the USMCA from an agricultural perspective was the belief that Canada would in fact open up its market for U.S. dairy. Uh, we are still having conversations with our Canadian friends about that. Uh, and we have actually triggered the consultation process or begun the consultation process that is provided for in the USMCA when you have a difficulty or a disagreement that's not getting worked, uh, worked through. Uh, so that's one of the benefits of USMCA, that there's actually a mechanism uh, for putting something on the table when you have a disagreement with uh, your trading partner. That's really important. We'll have more from that interview with Secretary Vilsack, including his big picture thoughts about the supply chain in the coming weeks. On the lighter side, as we edge further into the fall, if your landscape is suffering from a case of the blahs, this week's Southern Gardening segment is for you. Gary has a small but audacious plant that just might be the pick-me-up you're looking for. Here's Gary. One of the annual color plants I love are Gomfrina. Legend has it the original planting was at the gates of Hades. Yikes! But whether that was true or not, one thing is for certain, it grows like HE double hockey sticks. Gomfrina is a tough plant that will tolerate the heat of the summer and keep right on blooming into the fall season here at Truck Crops in Crystal Springs. One of my favorites is fireworks having iridescent pink flowers that have yellow tips resembling tiny firecrackers exploding. But this is a large plant with four foot potential. Truffle of Pink Gomfrina is a tough durable asset to any garden with growth that tops out at about 24 inches with a bushy mounding habit. Like its big cousin fireworks, this selection has wonderful hot pink charm with eye-catching pink flowers dotted all around with yellow stamens poking out. 
These plants will flower nonstop from spring all the way into the fall season. Gnome Gomprina delivers an explosion of color in mass plantings. The flowers resemble clover and have a straw-like texture. The flowers are produced in explosions of globular round blooms that invigorates any sunny landscape or garden bed. Gnome Gomprina has the potential to get about 16 inches tall. I have really been amazed with Gnome's ability to thrive in our seemingly unending heat, humidity, and precipitation. As you can see in this planting, Gomfrina makes for a great companion for other flowering annuals. I'm MSU Extension Horticulture Specialist Gary Bachman, and I hope you'll join us for the next Southern Guide. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, the pitfalls of urban farming. In Iowa, those shepherding unused land working to mitigate food insecurity, dealing with land owners needing to develop the land for other uses. It's a classic struggle of what may be helpful from a social point of view versus governments creating a tax base that keeps that city alive in the first place. The pitfalls of urban farming, a delicate balance that's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. Hi, I'm David Byes. And I'm Katie Byes. We know how important it is to take your health questions to experts you can trust. Who offer answers based on science. The science shows that the COVID vaccine is safe and effective at preventing the disease. Hundreds of millions of people have received the vaccine so far with very few side effects. But choosing to delay getting the vaccine increases the chance that COVID will spread. When it spreads, it mutates or develops variants. And we're seeing that variants can be even more dangerous than the original virus. Getting the vaccine is a personal decision, and when you choose to get it, you're protecting yourself, your family, and your neighbors. You're also protecting the most vulnerable people who can't take the vaccine. People being treated for cancer or organ transplants, people with serious illnesses, and small children. So get the answers you need. And get the vaccine. You'll, You'll be, be a, a hero. hero. Hi, I'm Jonah Holland, and I'm a communication major at Mississippi State University. As a college student, I'm young and generally pretty healthy. I try to take care of myself, but the coronavirus, especially the Delta variant, doesn't care about that. It's putting both young and healthy people alike in the hospital, not just older, sicker people. The best defense we have is the COVID-19 vaccine, and the first one has just received full approval from the FDA. Billions of people around the world have received it, and the science shows it is safe and effective. Right now, in Mississippi, more than 85% of people in the hospital with COVID are unvaccinated. 85%, think about that. So don't wait, talk to your doctor or pharmacist, get the facts you need, and get the vaccine. You'll be a hero. Time once again for the Market Report. Zach Ashmore here to sort out the numbers, including his market update and new reports from the USDA on row crops. What's it all about, Zach? Thanks, Mike. Market fluctuations, that's what it's all about. Markets mostly up last week, row crops getting the best of it while livestock on the downswing, but only by a little bit. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, lumber down $38, continuing a downswing in prices that appear a return to pre-COVID normal. Last week's biggest gain, wheat rising a whopping 50 cents, and soybeans not too far behind, rising about 38 cents as well. So, why the big rise in prices? Last week, the USDA released three reports that shed some light on row crops, namely corn, soybeans, and wheat. Here's what they said. November feed outlook said U.S. corn production projected to be 15,062 million bushels in 2021 and 22. Corn production raised 43 million bushels. Projected total corn use raised 50 million bushels based on strong pace of ethanol production. The projected season average farm price for corn is $5.45 per bushel. The oil crops outlook not so optimistic. Soybeans yield forecast 51.2 bushels per acre, down just a bit from last month. Total soybean supply 4.7 billion bushels, also down. Projected season average farm price $12.10 per bushel. Wheat outlook following the soybean trend. Export forecast 860 million bushels, down 15 million. Total food use 962 million bushels, down by 2 million. And season average farm price $6.90 per bushel. 
So now you know the context, let's see what the experts have to say. Market analyst Matt Bennett says he was surprised by the soybean yield. I was a little surprised by the soybean yield, quite frankly. Uh, you know, I think the trade was surprised, too. I, I don't think um, Chinese buyers maybe got what they wanted there. I mean, I think most of us felt like uh, this was a big bean crop that was going to get bigger yet. And so with your average trade guess at 51.9, most producers we talked to said that they had record yields or really, really good yields. Now you get into the eastern corn belt and I think there was a bit too much rain and we kept hearing that trend towards the end. So kind of took the shine off of it, maybe getting to a 52 and a half or something like that. But uh, we certainly, we guessed 51.75, ag market did, you know, and uh, 51.2 was a little bit lower than what we would have thought that it would be. But still, uh, your carryout was uh, 340, is up 20 million bushel. I, I kind of feel like they thought the crop was getting bigger, which meant that they weren't didn't have to be in a huge hurry. It seems to me like world buyers have been a little lackadaisical here. And then also, of course, the Brazilian crop went in the ground a little bit earlier than what uh, we saw a year ago, or even what we see a lot of times. We're talking about uh, Brazilian soybeans being ready to go here by the end of the year on the export market. So uh, I think a lot of these folks were thinking, hey, it's a big crop. We've got some time and I'm not so sure that they felt that way after the report came out. Obviously on meal, I think it's just another factor that kind of helps this soybean market uh, stay strong. Friday was a really good day, but on a percentage basis, meal surged much more uh, than what soybeans did. So, you know, I don't know that I would say I'm a, a huge bull as far as beans are concerned, but I do think that this week it certainly put an underpinning under the market that we didn't have coming into this week, not by any means. You know, I think that someone who was sitting around saying, I wish I would have gotten more beans sold, uh, you know, you rally 35, 40 cents and you've got to stop and ask yourself, uh, you know, what are you looking for now if you're not making that sale? Because uh, there's no doubt that uh, there's a chance you can go on up. You know, I mean, uh, I'm not uh, bearish necessarily, but at the same time, it's still a big bean crop and you still have the expectation that there would be a huge crop coming out of uh, Brazil. 144 million metric tons is a huge expectation. But with that being said, you know, maybe there is some potential here because we are counting on the weather to be awfully good in South America. You know, it's interesting because I don't think we got enough soft red winter wheat planted, uh, first of all. Second of all, the growers that planted it uh, that we talked to are saying they don't like how it looks for the most part. You know, it's obviously not rated overly well. And so uh, I think the wheat complex in total, I mean, 850, 860 wheat at times this week, you know, and then you're still looking in places like, for instance, St. Louis market, uh, 20 cents over for next July wheat. Uh, to me, those are awfully good levels. Are we going to see this go on up from here? I think it's anyone's guess, uh, but at the same time, I think this wheat market uh, has been has performed extremely well. I think you have to keep Minneapolis wheat well supported on down the road because we're going to need a fair amount of spring wheat acres. I mean, this wheat market looks awfully strong to me. I mean, last year, what you had was a lot of cheap feed wheat that got fed, okay? And so I don't want to talk wheat and corn at the same time, but keep that in the back of your mind whenever we talk about feeding stuff. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, this wheat market, what's going to stop it at this point? Uh, to me, you've got much smaller world stocks, much smaller uh, domestic stocks, you know, and quite frankly, I, I've, I've got to think that your production situation is enough of a question right now that it's going to be hard to kill this wheat market overnight. But essentially, I think that the corn market's a different animal than what the wheat market is for the most part. I think when you look at corn, a 1.5 carry out got dialed down just a little bit this week. Of course, you take yield up to 177, but when you've got a record yield and you're still looking at basis overs like we're seeing all around the Midwest, I mean, it's not everywhere, but, but in my backyard, uh, we've got a 30 over basis right here on the heels of harvest, and you just had a 177 record yield. I mean, that's not something you typically see. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Row crops moving up yet again, spurred on by supply issues, but harvest is not over yet. We'll see how it all pans out. Mike? Thank you, Zach. Urban farming in all its forms has come much further into vogue over the years, even more so since the beginning of the pandemic as supply chains have been stretched. Many urban farmers have accessed unused city and corporate land to grow primarily row crops. But there can be pitfalls and frustrations for the farmers themselves. Once again, here's Josh Bittner. Monica of Charsky cultivates her inner city community from the ground up through urban farming. Where we're standing was a redlined neighborhood. After moving into a historically underprivileged location near downtown Des Moines, Iowa, the young wife and mother also started the city's first community fridge and pantry, kept afloat by volunteers who share her commitment to eradicate food insecurity. 
The main difference between urban farming and gardening are probably scale, succession, and selling. The former social worker says fresh, chemical-free produce should never be considered a luxury item. Her Sweet Tooth Farm accepts food stamps and other assistance, shares farm implements with neighbors, and operates primarily right next door. When we moved here, this was Royal Park. The Parks Department actually still owns this space. We are stewards of this lot. Her push to convert the rundown spot to small-scale agricultural use impressed the city's director of Parks and Recreation, Ben Page, who says it's a first in his department's 125-year history. She's helped so many people. And I think it wouldn't be a surprise if I tell you Des Moines is not a wealthy city. I mean, we talk about 80 plus percent of our kids on free and reduced lunch. Another goal of the city was to find ways to stop these food deserts and to help people find local produce and healthy food. And you point to this as probably one of the successful things we started that movement with, which Monica. Despite local accolades, Ofcharsky's plan to expand from one to three acres was nipped in the bud this summer when another city division informed her they would not renew leases on two other parcels of industrial land she'd acquired both unused since the 1970s. It's quite a precarious position to be in. The explanation that we were given was that the city of Des Moines just doesn't have enough undeveloped land available for people. So they want to have it ready in case someone ever wanted to build on it. In a June email to the mayor and city council, Des Moines director of development services stated efforts to redevelop, expand the city's tax base and employment opportunities were behind the decision. Reiterating such properties are intended for development purposes in the long term. Ofcharsky says officials offered up another piece of land, but she found it inadequate for various reasons. This might sound um forward or blunt, but it is very easy to make a graphic or a hashtag about supporting local farms or shop local or even about healthy eating. It's much more difficult to put your money where your mouth is and make decisions that potentially are not as lucrative financially for the city, but could be exponentially better for the community in real terms. While her initial model is rather unique to the area, Nationwide, many urban gardeners have run afoul of what they call myriad hazy provisions as local governments adapt. When we talk about the laws and the policies that impact how we produce our food, who produces our food, uh, urban agriculture is definitely a growing part of that discussion. Jennifer Zwagerman is the director of Drake University's Agricultural Law Center in Des Moines. In addition to educating the next generation of attorneys, Drake publishes research and information on issues impacting food and farm production. Zoning is probably the biggest thing. And you know, you're also gonna need to look at tax issues. You're gonna need to look at uh, business issues. You know, how are you planning to operate? What changes if you plan to expand? Just a few miles away lies a pocket of unincorporated county land and another neighborhood farm. Dogpatch Urban Gardens, which also felt blindsided by bureaucracy in the recent past. Frankly, the hardships we faced, we almost just shut down the business. Former high school science teacher Jenny Quiner now sells fresh organic produce to restaurants, grocers, and at her farm stand. She says though diligent and proactive about local regulations, two years after startup, she faced around $75,000 in commercial storefront compliance requirements when Polk County officials updated her assessment. Initially, we were deemed a farm stand, which kind of checked the boxes. The two restrooms. My gut says the county probably thought that this will be a small thing that, you know, will just kind of float. But we ended up being more successful in getting a lot of people through the door which then got more eyes on our business. Ultimately, Quiner was able to rally with community donations covering a portion of the funds via a wildly successful online fundraiser. That really was an uplifting experience. In a statement, the Polk County Board of Supervisors commended local food producers, particularly during the pandemic, and said they're open to discussing unnecessary barriers to entry while maintaining fair rules to protect resident health and safety. The problem we dealt with was when we asked initially if we needed these things, we were told no. Quiner says those following in her footsteps should exhaust all legal advice before breaking ground. Efforts in recent years by Iowa's General Assembly to address urban farm zoning issues may have lost steam, but cities coast to coast have turned urban decay into bountiful harvests with support from federal grants through USDA.
Others counter land issues, which can be micromanaged at the homeowner association level, are best dealt with locally. The cities that have really worked to encourage this type of, of activity, they set clear definitions for what they expect, what's an urban garden versus a commercial enterprise. They're going to define that so that when you're thinking about entering this market or becoming part of this movement, you know what it is that you need to do. In the meantime, Ovcharsky is faced with a setback in production and may have no way to recoup the $10,000 she spent rehabbing the soil on lots the city is reclaiming. But she says she'll make it through with support from friends and neighbors. She plans to do her best avoiding similar issues in the search for new properties, but offers a word of caution. Unfortunately, bureaucracy moves a lot slower than the growing season. Bureaucracy, a challenge for business and agriculture, especially in the tightly packed cities where land can be at a premium. Well, next week, an ag bright spot in the middle of a drought. A great story decades in the making when the farm crisis hit 40 years ago. One family survived thanks to sunflowers. Now, despite the dryness, demand is up and so are prices. Even with COVID, they're through the roof. The industry could actually support another million acres. There's more competition, though, that in the rest of the story next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching.